In a Nuzlocke challenge, any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, and I'll only be allowed to catch and use one of each water type in the game. On top of that, I won't be using any setup moves for extra challenge. So can water types get me all the way to the credits of Pokemon Scarlet? Actually, I'm not even sure they can get me through the start of the game. You see, normally I could rely on Quaxley to get through the second Nimona fight by setting up with a workup and just sweeping. However, without setup moves, it might be tough to even get through the tutorial. Because while Nimona is one of the modern, less intelligent rivals, picking the starter weak to yours, it's definitely not her Fue Coco I'm worried about since we can just knock it out with a couple of water guns. The real issue is her terrestrializing Palmy. I can't believe I'm saying that since Palmy is a pretty pathetic Pokemon, but in this case, we can't even deal half damage with a water gun, whereas Palmy's double stab Thundershock deals more than half to us. Just to rub it in, she even gets a paralysis, meaning we can't even fish for a critical hit the next turn and get knocked out, swiftly ending attempt one. We clearly need a different approach, since base Quaxley just isn't gonna cut it. So I begin attempt two by catching a second Pokemon, an Azuril. The little guy does have huge power, but isn't actually a water type. To fight Nimona, I've got a wild backup plan, but while I prepare for it, I'll tell you about the sponsor of this video, Red Magic, a series of smartphones committed to providing players the ultimate gaming experience. And they just released their latest model, the Red Magic 8S Pro, an absolute beast of a gaming unit. And with the latest Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor, performance is incredibly smooth. Just to stress test it, I booted up balloons and spammed as many laggy towers as I could, but after several hours of desperately trying to get a lag spike, I failed and simply had a great time gaming. Playing Pokemon Unite even felt better than playing on the Switch with perfect performance, which aside from the processor is likely owed to the new and improved cooling system and the massive 16 gigabytes of RAM. No wonder this thing's so smooth, it's like a little gaming computer. It isn't that little though, with the 6.8 inch screen big enough to make gaming a great 120 hertz experience, but not too big, still fitting comfortably in my pocket. With three awesome designs to pick from, I truly recommend the Red Magic 8S Pro to anyone who wants to game on the go. So check out the link in the description and pinned comment below to pick yours up today and let's get back to the video. So instead, it's time for plan B. In Scarlet and Violet, there's a gap we can't cross until we get our hands on our ride Pokemon in Mesa Goza, gating us from the entire open world. But we can actually cheese our way across by starting a battle with this innocent Dunsparce, immediately teleporting us across the gap, getting us access to all of Paldea, except we're locked to traveling by foot. What follows is an absolute marathon. You see, my destination is Lavincia, but I also wanna pass through Porto Marinera, so I've got a loop around the entire region in just my sneakers. This at least unlocks a whole bunch of useful fast travel points along the way, and once I reach my first location, I pick up the Assault Vest, which is gonna be useful to tank those Thunder Shocks, and just generally one of the best items in the game. It does mean the user can't use any setup moves, but we're not using any of those anyway, so it's not even a drawback. Overall, this little maneuver cost me 46 minutes of my life that I am never getting back, and what do I have to show for it? A protective vest and the ability to surf. Heck, I'm ready to hit the waves. But more importantly, I'm ready to face Nimona again, and this time I'm not playing around, being leveled up all the way to the level cap, allowing me to take out Fue Coco in one surf, and not too surprising, even just one-shotting the Palmy with a surf as well. So finally, we're allowed to actually begin playing the game. Because we did all that walking, Azuril gained all the friendship it needed so that once it levels up versus Nimona, we have our Meryl. I'm so glad I don't have to take another step on foot in this challenge. Speaking of which, I ride my trusty Cyclozar to Casa Royal Lake to pick up Acrobatic. This 110 base power move, as long as we're not holding an item, is great for the early game since multiple gyms are weak to flying. The first gym fight versus Katie is one of them, and because her bugs are so incredibly frail, we can just take out her entire team with acrobatics. A nice change of pace from the difficulties we've been having so far. But our good matchups don't end there, since once Quaxley evolves into Quaxwell after the fight, we can immediately take on the Rock Titan Cloth, which isn't exactly known for its great special defense, so we knock it out in a single surf. Yeah, this one's not exactly the rocket science. From here, we've got two incredibly dangerous opponents ahead of us in Brassius and Iono, so we need to fill up the team. I head back close to Cortondo to capture an Eevee, and then fast travel to Cascarapa, where I can pick up a Waterstone. This way, we immediately get access to Vaporeon, and by fast traveling back to Lavincia, we can also give it Icy Wind. I then go catch a Psyduck. I don't think he has any idea what's going on. And in this little pond just southwest of Cortondo, we can pick up a Barboach. Finally, I head back to the very first beach where we face Nimona to pick up a Wingull. And thus, my team will 
was assembled for our greatest foe yet, the Grass Master Brassius. Admittedly, his first couple Pokemon really aren't that big a deal. We can use the exact same strategy that we used against Katie and just take them both out with a single acrobatics each. This leaves the real threat, Pseudo Wudo. With that 100 base attack, Trailblaze is gonna hit like a truck. Because I'm at full health, I decide to go for one acrobatics, which doesn't even do half. Pseudo Wudo then connects with a Trailblaze, hitting me into the yellow to just 20 HP. I'm in no position to take another Trailblaze, and Vaporeon won't be able to survive too. Sadly, this means that the most efficient way to get through this fight is to make a sacrifice. And while Psyduck can dish out some pain on his way out with a rocky helmet, I still don't think he's got any idea what's going on. Psyduck's sacrifice will not be in vain, however, because while Pseudo Wudo is faster than Vaporeon after the two Trailblazes, it can never take it out with a critical hit, and we can fire back with an Icy Wind, guaranteeing us the victory. And losing just one Pokemon to clear one of our worst matchups in the entire game is always a deal I'll take. With Meryl leveling up to 18 during the fight, when the level cap increases from 17 to 20, gives us access to Azumarill. And the timing for this evolution couldn't be better, since we already have access to Play Rough, and both of the upcoming boss battles are versus Dark types. The first one is versus the open Sky Titan Bomber Deer, which we can easily one-shot with a Play Rough during both phases. Next, we face the Dark Leader, Giacomo of Team Star. A quad effective Brick Break destroys his Ponyard, and just a few Play Roughs later, we've secured the victory. This means we've got to get ready to enter the Iono Zone. So I pick up the only other Pokemon I can get that evolves before level 24, Choodle, evolving it into Dreadnaw. I then figure Wingle will be completely dead weight during a fight versus an Electric Trainer, so I run into Basculin. I then head to Asado Desert to fight some trainers. I've got 20 years of studies at the Academy under my belt. Lewis, being held back in the fourth grade 16 times isn't something you should be bragging about. Anyway, after I destroy five trainers out here in the desert... <laughs> Talking to this guy gets us Earthquake that we can teach to Barboach, making us about as prepared as we can be to take on Iono. This girl's almost always a problem with her zero weakness Miss Magius, but with water types, it's amped up to the next level. Her first Pokemon Watchroll, we can at least take care of with a Rock Tomb from Dreadnaw. Second out is Belly Bolt, and I figured I had the best chance to go for some damage with Dreadnaw, but Rock Tomb basically accomplishes nothing except powering up the incoming Spark by activating Electromorphosis. Forced to swap out of Dreadnaw and expecting another Spark, I swap into my ground type Barboach. I then go for the Earthquake, but since Barboach is an incredibly weak Pokemon, it can't even secure the KO, getting hit by a water gun. That water gun almost did as much as the Earthquake, but at least the next turn, we can outspeed and take out the Belly Bolt. Luxio comes in next, and if Earthquake was doing terrible damage before, after the Intimidate, it won't be doing anything, so I swap into Quaxwell. Luxio was always going to go for the bite on the switch, but then it outspeeds going for a spark, taking Quaxwell down to just 2 HP. I could have easily lost my starter there for no good reason, but at least the Surf on the Clapback just straight up takes out Luxio. This just leaves the real Real problem, Miss Magius. If I let Quaxwell stay in, he's a goner, so I'm forced to swap out sending in Barboach, expecting the Charge Beam. Now, Barboach really can't touch this Miss Magius, but what it can do is guarantee that Miss Magius goes for either Hex or Confuse Ray as we swap out into Azumarill. And after not taking too much damage from Hex because of Assault Vest, I do get confused. And with my luck, that can only mean one thing, I'm hitting myself in confusion. And that's the moment I realized this fight is far from over. My next turn is incredibly lucky, where Charge Beam doesn't get the special attack boost, and I actually connect with Aqua Tail, doing over half. Azumarill would instantly faint to another Charge Beam, so I have to swap out into Barboach. Barboach still can't do anything, though, so I swap into Basculin, who gets hit by a Confuse Ray. And at this point, I feel like I'm just being tormented by Nelson from The Simpsons. Stop hitting yourself! Stop hitting yourself! Oh. My failed attempt at connecting with a water gun just leads to Basculin being taken out, and Miss Magius gets the special attack boost. At this point, there's not much I can do. The Miss Magius is faster than all of my Pokemon, and it started boosting its attack power. Continuing her taunting, Iono confuses Vaporeon, which, of course, hits itself in its confusion. In comes Charge Beam, and I'm pretty sure Vaporeon can survive, but it ends up being a critical hit. So Miss Magius takes out yet another one of my Pokemon, and gets another special attack boost. At this point, all I can hope and pray for is to break out of confusion and hit this thing, but it just ends up going for Charge Beam against Dreadnought, taking it out, and getting another special attack boost. I send back in Barboach, who gets hit by a Confuse Ray, and now the rain is up. If we can just break through confusion, this could be your moment to shine, you son of a bitch. Rootbeard does it and breaks through confusion in the rain, hitting a water pulse for 
barely any damage at all. You were the chosen one, Barboach. You were supposed to deal damage, not take it. With two Pokemon left at low health that can't outspeed Miss Magius, all hope is lost. All I can do is watch my last two Mons get zapped into oblivion. With Azumarill gone, my last Pokemon is at 4 HP. So I click my final move and watch it all fall apart. Wait a minute, Charge Beam is 90% accurate? And Miss Magius had to wait all the way to the last second to miss a move? Losing five Pokemon could be reason enough to reset a run, but in this case, I'm not sure I could do better against Iono in a third attempt, so despite having lost some of our best encounters in the game in Azumarill, Dreadnought, and Vaporeon, I think I'm still gonna give this attempt a chance. But with only two Pokemon left, we're gonna need some new team members. So I head to the beach outside Lavincia and pick up a Merciless Marini. Then I go grab a Pokemon I'm very very glad we still have access to in the run, Magikarp. With the Electric-type gym behind us, and thus most of the Electric-types we're gonna face in the entire game, Gyarados is going to be an absolute house. In fact, we're gonna put Gyarados to use right away, because the next boss battle we have to face is versus Mela of Team Star, and with her team full of Fire-types, as you might imagine, I'm not worried at all. I first get rid of the Sun that her Torkoal sets up by using Rain Dance, which also doubles the power of my water moves, allowing me to take it out in one hit. Her Starmobile is much bulkier, and doesn't go down to one hit, and even manages to get a burn with Blazing Torque. This is a minor inconvenience to us, since it makes the next waterfall just barely miss out on the KO. But since the Starmobile has no way to deal any meaningful damage to Gyarados whatsoever, it basically just prolongs the inevitable one more turn. With Mela defeated, we move on to the nearby wastes to take on the Titan Orthworm. And this pathetic hunk of junk only has normal type moves and resisted steel type moves to hit me with. And my Gyarados has a secret weapon. Flamethrower Gyarados! What? No! Uh, yeah, for some reason Gyarados gets Flamethrower. I don't know what the devs were smoking when they gave the Gen 1 Pokemon their movesets, but this day is not the day you'll see me complain about it. Continuing our streak of back-to-back -back battles, I take on Kofu. And sadly, I can't go through with my initial strategy since our Vaporeon is gone. This, however, turns out to not be the biggest issue in the world. Because even though Vaporeon would have been completely immune to Kofu's Water-type moves with Water Absorb, all of my other Pokemon already resist Water with their own Water-typing. And if we're being completely honest, Vaporeon doesn't get any great moves to fight other Water-type Pokemon. So in the end, it probably just ended up being a time save to use Gyarados to beat the gym instead. With our best matchups behind us, we need to think about upgrading the team again. And to give us a head start, Wingle evolves after the gym fight into Pelipper. I then head to the Paldean Coast to pick up our next encounter, a Shelder, that I named Diet Pepsi. Starting to run out of ideas for sodas, work with me here. Because we have more than three gym badges, we can just straight up purchase the evolution stones at this point to get us another water stone. This means we can immediately evolve Diet Pepsi into the water ice type Cloister. The most realistic encounter to pick up after that is Shellos, since we've got Atticus coming up, and Gastrodon being a ground type is a perfect addition to the team. We do have a few pretty good options against Atticus, however, and I know you won't believe me when I say it, but one of them is of course Gyarados. One thing that did catch me off guard is that Skuntank actually outspeeds and manages to land a Toxic. This does put Gyarados on the clock and means we probably can't solo the fight with it, but we can at least take out Skuntank with an Earthquake. Muck we can simply outspeed, and while Revivroom is faster and deals some pathetic damage with Assurance, a quad effective Earthquake takes it out too. We now only have to deal with the Starmobile, but since Gyarados is poisoned, we can't stay in. This is why we brought Gastrodon, since the Starmobile can barely touch Gastro with its strongest move, allowing us to just take it out with a few Earth powers. We're then finally at the point where our level cap allows us to evolve our starter into its final form, and while I love Quaquable, I'm never gonna get over how it runs. <laughs> Luckily, we're not entering into a race, and instead the fifth gym fight versus Larry. And as it turns out, getting a powerful fighting type just before the normal type gym is just what the doctor ordered. We are in a bit of trouble once he sends in his ace Star Raptor, since he both lowers our attack and has super effective flying type moves. So I send in Gyarados to intimidate him right back, but after I get off a waterfall, Gyarados is at pretty low health. So not wanting to lose my strongest Pokemon, I swap out into the one I have with the strongest defense being Cloyster, which after getting hit by 
by a couple of facades, uses its skill ink ability to guarantee five hits with Icicle Spear, which is more than enough to take out Staraptor's remaining health. And while I'm sorry I made Larry work overtime, at least breaking the level cap means we can evolve Marini at level 37. As we approach the showdown versus Rhyme, however, I am a little bit worried. Because the same way I'm not using setup moves, you may have noticed I'm not allowing terastalization. This means the gym battle versus Rhyme goes from being a free gimmick battle that's a complete joke to an actually more fair fight. Well, kind of. Rhyme still offers us a few advantages if we manage to find KOs before she does. So to try and accomplish that, I lead with Gyarados to get an Intimidate on both of her physically attacking Pokemon and then just use Crunch to take out Banette. This is going to guarantee we pick up an attack boost at the end of the turn, but before that happens, I get to use Icicle Spear with Cloyster. This serves two purposes, since it both breaks Mimikyu's disguise and the remaining four hits gets it to a point where we can easily knock it out the next turn. Then, once Rhyme sends in her next Pokemon Houndstone, the crowd starts going wild, getting us our free attack boost for both of our Pokemon. Then, since Cloyster is a lot slower than Mimikyu, I use a priority Ice Shard to take out its remaining health. From there, Gyarados is simply faster than Houndstone, not allowing it to do anything in this fight, taking it out with a single crunch. Finally, she sends in her Toxtricity just before we get our second attack boost from the crowd. And again, because Toxtricity is faster than Cloyster, I go for the plus two Ice Shard, almost dealing half damage to it, and Gyarados, which is faster, can finish off the rest with a plus two crunch, for what I consider a near perfect execution of strategy. We then have to worry about the great Tusk Titan, but taking one look at its moveset, Brick Break is simply resisted by Gyarados's flying type, and for the exact same reason, Stomping Tantrum won't do anything at all, meaning that once again, Gyarados claims us a completely effortless badge. This means I need to prepare to take on Tulip, so I go and find a Barrascuda. And this thing is insanely strong, while simultaneously being faster than Sonic, even though it does look like one of those singing fish my granddad had. Are you excited? Show me! No, Barrascuda never excited. <laughs> the only thing Barrascuda ever gets excited about is tearing things apart. And who am I to stand in the way of what's meant to be? Perigarath gets gobbled up by a couple of crunches, and while a waterfall isn't enough to take out Gardevoir in one hit, I manage to land a flinch and just take it out the next. Third out is Espathra, and even though Barrascuda has taken some damage, because it's holding an assault vest, I feel comfortable leaving it in against this psychic, which leaves me at 6 HP. I can then just follow that up with a priority Aqua Jet to take out as Pathra's remaining health, leaving just her final Pokemon, Florges. I definitely don't think Barrascuda can take Florges out in one crunch, so I decide to swap out into Gyarados to tank a Moonblast, and then take care of the Florges with a couple of crunches, granting us the seventh gym badge. While I hate jumping through a bunch of hoops to take on Tulip, like taking on Nimona and the gym puzzle that never ends, it's almost worse that to face Gresha, we only have to glide down this simple slope that's an absolute piece of sh**. Unfortunately, the actual gym fight was not quite as simple, but just as bad. I Ice types are generally not an issue. A lot of the best types in the game have great matchups versus ice, like steel or fighting. And with water resisting ice, you'd think there wouldn't be a problem. Heck, we even have Flamethrower on Gyarados that just barely misses out on the KO versus Frostmoth, allowing it to set up a Tailwind. Which is what ends up leading to the real kicker. Why do I always get frozen at the worst possible time? I mean, don't get me wrong, I realize there's no good time to get frozen in a Pokemon battle, but that just takes Gyarados completely out of the fight. The one good thing is we can send in Quackaval against a Blizzard, which activates its Snowball and boosts its attack. I then pray to every god I could think of that this Blizzard wouldn't freeze me and take out Frostmoth with an Acrobatics. Second out is Bear Tick, and because we got that attack boost from our Snowball, one Brick Break is all it takes to knock it out. This in turn brings in Satitan, but because the Titan is so insanely bulky, and I really don't want to take my chances at such low HP, I swap out into my best defensive Pokemon, Cloyster. And because it's my best damaging option, we have a battle of liquidations, which of course I end up winning since mine isn't resisted. This leaves Grusha with only his final Pokemon, Altaria. My plan for Grusha's Altaria is simple. It only has special attacks, so I send in my Assault Vested Barrascuda. What I wasn't prepared for is a Stab Hurricane actually connecting and landing the confusion. Any other move, and we would have survived with over half health, but as it stands, I have to swap out into Pelipper, who also gets hit by a critical hit, Hurricane. The next one does miss, but because my Pelipper has a terrible moveset, a Water Pulse barely does anything. Which leads to our first disaster of the fight, the fall of Pelipper. I send in Gastrodon, figuring it's my best bet at surviving a Hurricane, and by some miracle from whichever god answered my prayers, it does less than half and I don't get confused. Another Hurricane connects, but it doesn't get a critical hit, allowing 
me to survive, and because I'm not confused, I take the Altaria down into the red. At this point, my options are quickly dwindling. With all my Pokemon at low HP, I don't have a choice but to just swap in Barascuda and just hope for Arceus' sake that I dodge the hurricane. It does not. It very much hits me because why wouldn't it? Goodbye, singing fish. A third of our team has been swept away in the storm, but at least this means Quaquable can come in and clean up the rest of Altaria's health, granting us the eighth gym badge at a great cost. With both a fairy and fighting badge coming up, I figure I'll get a Pokemon to resist both of them, Quillfish. And say what you will about Quillfish's stats, but at least it's got Intimidate. Wait, you're saying mine doesn't have Intimidate? Ah, fuck! Anyway, even though our Quillfish is useless, we still have to take on Ortega of Team Star. And luckily for this one, Quillfish is not a necessary contingency plan. Setting up Toxic Spikes to both boost the power of Venoshock and turn them into critical hits every time because of Merciless is enough to easily knock out Ortega's first three Pokemon. And even though Stormobiles can't be poisoned, I can deal a whole lot of damage with Venoshock before I'm forced to swap out. From there, I can count on Skill Link Cloyster to always hit five times with Icicle Spear and guarantee the KO versus the Stormobile. This leads to our preparations for Aerie, who's normally one of the scariest fights to take on in the game. My first order of business is to capture a Slowpoke that I named Dr. Pepper. I guess I do know more sodas and I'm just slow. Bro. Then I go catch a Veluza, and I really like what Game Freak did here. They saw their Bruxish and went, oh god, that was a mistake, and went and made a much better design, an epic battle tuna. You're saying its stats are much worse? You had one job, Game Freak. And with our two new psychic types, Eri is actually not that big a deal. Her first four Pokemon are no match against our bulky water types. Once she's down to just her Starmobile, we can send in Slowbro, and the thing basically can't touch us, allowing us the chance to freely take it out and grab our final star badge. And once we've taken on the False Dragon Titan, we're left with a choice. We can either immediately challenge the Elite Four or tie up the other two storylines. And I definitely made the wrong choice. The first fight versus Arvin was not an issue. We've got great matchups versus his team, so beating him was quick, making it easy to complete the Path of Legends. The Team Star storyline, on the other hand, requires us to beat Director Clavel. And the man's team is an absolute nightmare for our water types to deal with. His first Pokemon, Oranguru, is the easiest of the bunch. It takes over half damage from a Skill Link Icicle Spear and then tries to put us to sleep with Yawn. Not only is this an incredibly predictable strategy, it's also very easy to work around since after taking out Oranguru, once Yawn puts Cloyster to sleep, we can instantly get rid of it by just giving it a held Chestoberry. This leads us to our first problem Pokemon, Obama Snow. This Grinch of a Christmas tree gets its defenses boosted by the snow. Because of that, the damage I'm able to put out with neutral Icicle Spears is pathetic. And to make matters worse, Obama Snow sets up Aurora Veil further boosting its defenses. Because of that, it doesn't even look like Icicle Spear is going to be a three-hit KO. Luckily, I know Obama Snow is going to be willing to help me along the way, since its only super effective move, Woodhammer, deals massive recoil damage. But even so, another five Icicle Spears is not enough to take out the Obama Snow. So I'm struck by another Woodhammer, fortunately leaving me at seven HP, which also deals with Obama Snow for me. Third out is Gyarados, our next problem Pokemon. We obviously can't stay in with Cloyster, so so I swap out into Slowbro, who can easily tank the Aqua Tail on the switch and deal some Rocky Helmet damage back. Gyarados then deals a lot of damage with a super effective Crunch, which deals some more Rocky Helmet damage before we heal off a little bit more damage than we took with Slack Off. Crunch comes in again, this time getting a defense drop, meaning that our strategy is getting less and less effective by the second. I Slack Off again, getting me almost up to full, and as long as Gyarados doesn't get a crit, we can survive the next Crunch, and hopefully after Rocky Helmet, a Psychic is enough to take it out, but why would it be? I was hoping that would be enough, but now I'm forced to swap, sending in my own Gyarados to lower the other Gyarados attack with Intimidate, which means Crunch doesn't do too much damage, and a Crunch of my own is enough to finish it off. Houndoom is the easiest Pokemon to counter, since its only physical move is Thunderfang, which we're immune to with Gastrodon. Since all its other moves are special, we can equip Gastro with the Assault Vest to easily tank them and fire back with Earth Power. Houndoom does manage to land a flinch with the second Dark Pulse, but isn't quite so lucky with the third, so we take it out with a second Earth Power. This leaves Clavel with his two last Pokemon, the first of which being Poltegeist. My first idea is swapping in Gyarados. This way I get an Intimidate to power down Sucker Punch, and on the switch I'm struck with a Shadow Ball, taking me below half HP. I was then really hoping to take this Poltegeist out, but not only do I leave it in the red, I also double its speed by activating Weak Armor. 
Just to rub it in my face, Clavel decides to burn my Gyarados, even though I'm now slower than Poltegeist, so I'm forced to swap the next turn anyway. And unfortunately, I need to swap something in safely, so I'm gonna have to make a sacrifice. It sucks to lose a Pokemon as great as Slowbro, but all my other Pokemon on the team fill a very specific niche. Once I safely get in Toxapex, it manages to dodge a Will-O-Wisp and fire off a Venoshock, which doesn't KO the Poltegeist. Not the end of the world, since it just misses another Will-O-Wisp, but dang, that's a weak Venoshock. With Poltegeist, out of the way, we run into the biggest issue on Clavel's team. Even though Toxapex isn't weak to grass, Meowskarada has Thunder Punch. And the only way I can fight back is to fire off Venoshocks, which aren't dealing enough damage. It's not even using Flower Trick, but the second Thunder Punch takes me down into the red with a critical hit. And after using its final weak Venoshock, a third Thunder Punch takes Toxapex out. Yet another necessary sacrifice to safely send in Coquavel at full HP. There's only one way to survive this Flower Trick, and it's to equip Coquavel with a Focus Sash. It's the entire reason I've never sent in my starter to guarantee that it's at full HP, so that we don't instantly lose to this Meowskarada that can outspeed all my Pokemon and probably take them out in one hit. The final fight in the Starfall Street storyline is to take on Penny and all of her evolutions. And the only real threats to our water types on our team are Jolteon and Leafeon. Quaquable can deal with Umbreon without even taking any damage. Penny then sends in Jolteon, which really isn't a problem since we kept Gastrodon alive from the last fight and are totally immune to Thunder, meaning it's a completely free KO after a couple of Earth powers. Our quad weakness to Grass then of course baits in Leafeon. I thought about how to tackle this for a long time and figured the safest bet is actually just to sacrifice the Lusa. It's a dumb fish and I wish they would have made it better. This sacrifice makes way to send in Choice Scarfed Cloister. And because the second hit with Icicle Spear even lands a critical hit, it's actually just a one-hit KO and we don't have to deal with Leafeon anymore. Flareon is, of course, one of the easiest to defeat for our water types, just sending in Gastrodon again and taking it out with a couple of Earth powers. Her Vaporeon is admittedly a bit annoying to deal with, since it's got Water Absorb and it's incredibly tanky. The only thing it can really do to Gyarados, though, is Hydro Pump, and by giving it an Assault Vest, it's incredibly easy to wear it out and take it out with Crunch. Finally, we face her terastalizing Sylveon. So I begin by sending in Quillfish, the only Pokemon I have that resists its Stab Moonblast. It still takes a heck of a lot of damage since, you know, Quillfish stinks, but I can at least outspeed and fire back with a Poison Jab against Sylveon before getting taken out by a Shadow Ball. Quillfish is by far the least useful Pokemon on my team, and I definitely won't be bringing it to the Elite Four anyway, so sadly, it's a useful sacrifice to get in Scarf Cloister for free and finish off Sylveon with Icicle spear. We lost a lot of Pokemon doing it, but at least we completed Starfall Street. However, because we lost so many Pokemon doing it, we're gonna need to pick up a few to fill up our roster for the Elite Four. I begin by catching a Finny Zen that I call Lemonade. I know it's not a soda, I'm just really running out of options here. And when it evolves, it barely looks any different for now, but Palafin is actually a pretty cool Pokemon. I also go capture a Float Soul to round off my team for the Elite Four. And the team I'm bringing is Coca-Cola the Quackable with Aqua Step, Close Combat, Ice Spinner, and Acro Acrobatics. Trocadero the Gyarados. It's a Swedish soda, and we just don't have that many in this country. Give me a break. With Waterfall, Ice Fang, Crunch, and Earthquake. Diet Pepsi, the Skill Ink Cloister, with Liquidation, Ice Shard, Icicle Spear, and Rock Blast. Sun Kissed the Gastrodon, with Earth Power, Muddy Water, Recover, and Stealth Rock. Fanta Exotic the Floatzel, with Liquidation, Aqua Jet, Crunch, and Ice Fang. And Lemonade the Palafin, with Flip Turn, Jet Punch, Ice Punch, and Close Combat. And with that team, we're definitely ready to take on the first member of the Elite Four, Rika, and her ground types. To power up Finizen, we need to swap it out and then back in, so I lead with it and go for a flip turn to deal a bit of damage to Whizcash and swap out into Gastrodon. And while Gastrodon won't be dealing any meaningful damage, we swap it in here to get up a Stealth Rock so that we can break Domfan's Sturdy. We then swap it out for Lemonade again, who's now transformed into its hero form. In its hero form, it's got 160 base attack, more than enough to take care of every single one of Rika's Pokemon as soon as we've broken that Sturdy. This quickly gets us to our second opponent, the Master of Steel types, Poppy. Kind of ironic that her lead is the ace Pokemon of another trainer in the series that shares a flower name. Regardless, we can instantly delete the Kaparaja by just going for Earthquake with Gyarados. This also serves the secondary purpose of baiting in Magnezone. We want to get rid of the Electro type as soon as possible, since outside of Gastrodon, we have no answers for this thing. But just a couple of Earth powers later, it's no longer a problem. In comes Corviknight, and after being displeased with the damage I can do with Muddy Water, 
water, I decide to send in Gyarados to intimidate it. This way will take a lot less damage from Brave Bird, or so I thought, until it gets a critical hit. At least the recoil damage puts it in range of being taken out by a waterfall, so I'll take what I can get. Once Bronzong comes in, I'm a bit uncomfortable about Gyarados' health, so I swap out into Cloyster, who dodges a Zen headbutt. And because of Cloyster's massive defense, this physically attacking Bronzong can't really touch it, and I can take it out with a couple of liquidations. Finally, this just leaves Tinkaton, which for the first time in the fight, causes a bit of an issue. Three of my Pokemon are at too low health, Palafin won't survive if I swap it in, and I want to keep Quackable's Focus Sash intact, leaving me with just one option. And sadly, it's not an awesome option, since Gigaton Hammer does a gigaton of damage. Floatzel does get to do something at least, firing off a liquidation, not even dealing half to Tinkaton, as it then just KOs me with Play Rough. This lets me send in Focus Sash Quackable, which means we're guaranteed to win the fight, because even though Tinkaton gets a Play Rough critical hit, it can never knock me out, and with a final close combat, we take out the second second member of the Elite Four, in today's episode of Life with Larry. Just another day at the office. There's only one more Elite Four member to face, and it's the Dragon Master Hassel. He leads with Noivern, so my best bet is sending in Assault Vest Gyarados, since the most damage he could ever do to me is half with Super Fang. This means as long as I don't miss the 95% accurate Ice Fang, it's a guaranteed KO. Second out is Dragalge, which is perfect since it knows Thunderbolt and we can freely swap in Gastrodon. Personally, I think he's better off going for Sludge Bomb here to at least try and get the poison, but with a couple of Earth Powers, we can eliminate Dragalge completely. Third out is Flapple, and if you know anything about Flapple, you know it's slow as dirt. So once I send in my Focus Sash Quackable, which can never be taken out by a Seed Bomb, I'm free to just outspeed and take it out with a quad effective Ice Spinner. Fourth out is Hassel's Haxorus which is most likely going to go for Dragon Claw here, giving me the perfect opportunity to swap out into Cloyster. With the Choice Scarf, Cloyster is faster than Haxorus, and it only takes four Icicle Spears to knock it out. This leaves Hassel with his only Pokemon not weak to Ice, Baxcalibur. However, once he terrestrializes, getting rid of his defensive Ice typing, Ice is super effective. The only problem is, after all the five hits of Icicle Spear, it doesn't knock it out. This means I'm getting hit by a double stab boosted Glaive Rush. Wait a minute, I survived that? Guess we get to bring five Mons against the champion. Champion Gita has a few tricky Pokemon to deal with. First of all, her Letus Pathra's ability makes it impossible to set up versus it. That won't really create any problems, though, since we're not allowed to set up our stats in the challenge anyway. Instead, I begin the fight by using Flip Turn with Palafin to swap in Assault Vest Gyarados. The Espathra then sets up Reflect on the switch, meaning that after it hits me with a critical hit Lumina Crash the next turn, I can't one-shot it with a crunch. Even though Lumina Crash lowers your special defense by two stages, because of the Assault Vest, we can still take another one, and with another crunch, we can take out the Espathra. Second out is her King Gambit, and I'm unsure if I can take it out with one Earthquake, so I decide to swap out of Gyarados and to instead send in Gastrodon, who tanks a Stone Edge beautifully. Gastro is then hit by a Kowtow Cleave, unfortunately getting a critical hit. But Gastrodon answers that crit with a critical hit right back, taking out King Gambit. Predictably, we then have to face Go-Goat, and since we're quad weak to grass, we definitely have to swap out. With Cloyster's defense, I'm not really afraid of the super effective Horn Leech, and the next turn, we can just outspeed with the Choice Scarf, and four hits is enough to knock out the Go-Goat. Gita's fourth Pokemon, Avalug, is a bit of a problem. This thing has a but ton of defense, outscaling even Cloyster, to the point where five hits of Rock Blast only does half of its health. I'm then struck with a Body Press, taking Cloyster dangerously low. Not wanting to gamble with Cloyster's life on whether or not I hit a 90% accurate Rock Blast, I swap out into Gyarados to get an Intimidate off, which works out terribly since it's got own tempo. Then expecting an Avalanche, I swap out into Palafin, who can take it beautifully with that resistance. Finally, we get to be rid of this thing with a close combat from Palafin. One issue with this is that Palafin is Scarfed, so when Gita sends in Veluza, we're locked into a resisted move. On top of that, we don't exactly have any great options to swap into at this point. Knowing that a crit from Psycho Cut will take out whatever I decide to swap in here, I have to do something and swap in Gyarados to lower its attack. I'm lucky enough to dodge the Psycho Cut and swap back into Palafin. Unfortunately, Palafin doesn't have any great moves to go for, but it would have been terrible to be locked into close combat since it lowers my defenses every single use. That way, it's better to be dealing a little bit less damage with Jet Punch without just 
being knocked out after a few hits. Eventually, the inevitable happens, and Beluza gets a critical hit Psycho Cut, taking Palafin really low. There's just no way I can risk losing a Pokemon as good as Palafin, so I'm gonna have to sacrifice something else. Gyarados is too valuable, I might need the Focus Sash on my starter intact to even make it through this fight, and without Gastro, my chances to beat the run drastically decrease. The only choice left is Cloyster, who takes the hit and actually survives? This time, I am forced to gamble with a Rock Blast, and thankfully, I connect. It almost looks like five hits won't be enough to take Veluza out, but thankfully, I'm done with this stupid fish. Gita now only has one Pokemon left, and because Cloyster survived, I'm basically guaranteed to win this fight. After Gita, there are only two mandatory fights left in the game, and it all comes down to who's going to be the least useful member in those two fights. It really isn't a choice I want to make, but I think my best bet is sacrificing my starter. And after being hit by Earth Power on the Switch, a Dazzling Gleam will be enough to take us out. Quackable is the reason this run is alive in the first place because of surviving against Iono. And once again, in my greatest time of need, Quackable comes through. I'm glad you're the one who made me the champion of Paldea, buddy. You're one reliable mother ducker. Unfortunately, becoming champion doesn't make us the very best like no one ever was. So to fill up my team, I capture a love disc. I am really running out of options at this point. In some places, you would give a love disc to someone you love. Excuse me, what? I'd have to hate someone to give them this piece of sh- Actually, giving love disc to one of my enemies is a pretty decent plan. You see, Nimona's team really isn't too difficult for our water types to deal with. However, after taking out Gudra, my choice scarf Quackavo was locked into Ice Spinner. So in order to swap moves, I switch out and give Nimona the gift of a love disc. I suppose love disc can be useful, even if just as death fodder. The only thing putting me at risk is that the rest of my team has taken a lot of damage throughout the fight. I start by hitting Skeledurge with a flip turn from Palafin, and because it's the Pokemon with the most HP I have left, I have to send in Quackable, who determined to make it to the final boss of the run, survives a Shadow Ball on just 6 HP, and with a final Aqua Step, closes out the victory road. With only one fight remaining in the game, we need to pick up one final encounter, which is gonna have to be Tatsugiri. Didn't even know this thing was a water type, but I'm taking it with me on the way home. We've made it this far, and all that remains is to take on the final boss of the run. AI Sada has a team stacked full of Pokemon of near legendary power. Her blast from the past is here to show us Pokemon used to be better back in the day, but I'm here to show her how Mother Duckers do it in Gen 9. Somehow her Slitherwing immediately outspeeds Quackable. I must have terrible IVs. But regardless, with no item held, one acrobatics is enough to take the Slitherwing out. Predictably, this leads to Sada sending in her weakest Pokemon, Screamtail. This thing has terrible attacking stats, and for some reason, they made this thing a pure physical attacker, so we can lower its attack even further with an Intimidate from Gyarados. This lets us swap in Palafin without taking very much damage at all. I make this pivot into Palafin before swapping out into Cloyster, just so that it'll be in its hero form if we swap it back in. With Cloyster's insane defense, we're basically completely safe from this thing. Even its super effective Drain Punch barely does any damage at all, eventually leading to Screamtail fainting after being hit by enough Icicle Spears. Third out is Fluttermane, which is a bit of an issue since it has Thunderbolt. This is why it was so incredibly important not to lose Gastrodon earlier in the run, since this way we're unaffected by Thunderbolt, and with an Assault Vest, we can tank its other special attacks very well. From there, a couple of Earthquakes is all it's gonna take to drop Fluttermane. Sada's fourth Pokemon is another problem the grass-type Brute Bonnet. The best option I have to swap into this thing is Gyarados, which only takes neutral damage from grass. The added bonus of Intimidate means it'll do a lot less damage with its other physical moves, which comes in handy instantly since the Brute Bonnet goes for a Sucker Punch the next turn, dealing close to no damage. So it's pretty safe for Gyarados to go for a few Ice Fangs, eventually taking out the Brute Bonnet. Sada now only has two Pokemon left, the first of which being Sandy Shocks. This dusty old Magneton could take out Gyarados from full health, so we've got to swap back out into Gastrodon. Sandy Shocks now has no super effective moves to hit us with, and the Assault Vest comes in handy once again, as we trade Earth Powers, mind dealing significantly more damage. Another Earth Power takes Gastrodon into the red, but our second Earth Power is enough to eliminate Sandy Shocks. All that remains is Sada's final Pokemon, the Roaring Moon. With a booster energy, its protosynthesis ability gives it a 30% attack boost, but at such little health, there's no way Gastrodon is surviving anything this thing is throwing at us. Your time has come, Tatsugiri. Your time to avenge all of water kind. With a Focus Sash, I don't care if this Roaring Moon is at max speed and max attack. We're always surviving this hit, no matter how hard you hit. And all I need is one turn to deliver sweet, sweet justice.
And so my water types prevailed, emerging victorious against the evil AI Sada. It's been a long time since I used water types, and to be honest, it proved to be a lot more challenging than I expected. And hey, if you enjoyed this one, why not check out another run? Wait, no, I wasn't talking to you, Quackable. <laughs>